Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I hope you are having a fabulous Thursday so far. I'm having a great Thursday because I get to bring you yet another author interview. This time we're not only talking about books, but we're talking about editing and working at the Tahoma Literary Review and all kinds of things. I am speaking today with author and editor and lover of all things writing related <laughs> Yi Shun Lai. She has written um, one nonfiction book, excuse me, one fiction book. I keep saying nonfiction when I mean fiction. She's written one fiction book called Not a Self-Help Book, The Misadventures of Marty Wu, which just, I don't know, the first time I saw that uh, title, I was like, I need to read that book before I even knew that she was going to be on the podcast. So I love the title. She also does a um, Nonfiction writing. She does editing, as I said. She does a lot of work in the world of writing. She is working on a second novel. And so she was just so much fun to talk to. I said in the last episode when I was previewing this one that for like an hour after we got off the interview, my cheeks hurt because I was just, I'd been smiling and laughing so much when talking to Yishan. It was just a delightful conversation. I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoyed participating in it. So first, let me give you a brief overview of that book, Not a Self-Help Book, The Misadventures of Marty Wu. And that description is as follows. Marty Wu, compulsive reader of advice manuals, would love to come across as a poised young advertising professional. Instead, she trips over her own feet and blurts out inappropriate comments. The bulk of her brain matter, she decides, consists of gerbils, spinning madly in alternating directions. Marty hopes to someday open a boutique costume shop, but it's hard to keep focused on her dream. First comes a spectacular career meltdown that sends her ricocheting between the stress of New York and the warmth of supportive relatives in Taiwan. Then she faces one dram domestic drama after another, with a formidable mother who's impossible to please, an annoyingly successful and well-adjusted brother, and surprising family secrets that pop up just when she doesn't want to deal with them. Mining the comedic potential of the 1.5 generation American experience, Not a Self-Help Book is an insightful and witty portrait of a young woman scrambling to balance familial expectations and her own creative dreams. So that is the overview for Not a Self-Help Book, The Misadventures of Marty Wu. As I said, I um, I don't know if I said it explicitly, but I think you could probably tell by my voice that I loved this book. I uh, mentioned in the interview that I was laughing hysterically one night while I was reading it before bed and my husband just looked over at me and he's like, what are you reading? And I read him a couple of passages and he laughed also, but he just, he, he sometimes looks at me like I've lost my mind when I'm reading and laughing out loud while reading, but that's okay. I don't mind having lost my mind in a, in a literary sense when it comes to my reading. I'm perfectly okay with that. Anyway, so this book is hilarious. Uh, Yishan's writing is fabulous. She has, I, I highlighted so many quotes and things that I, uh, that I appreciated on one level or another, or another, whether they were poignant, whether they made me laugh, whether they made me think about something in my own life. I really enjoyed the story. I really enjoyed the writing and it is hilarious, but it also deals with these deeper issues. Marty's relationship with her mother is extremely complicated. She is, as it says, you know, that 1.5 generation. She was born in Taiwan, but then moved to America at a young age. So she deals with issues around her own cultural identity and how she fits into both worlds. She and her mother's part of their, their, 
their difficulty in communication is that they do come from different cultures because of the way that they were raised and the families they were raised in. So it takes a really great look at life in a specific setting in this um, Asian family with Marty being that 1.5 generation. It does so with warmth and humor and I feel like as I was laughing, I was also learning a lot of things that I didn't necessarily know about um, this culture that Marty is describing that she grew up in and then the culture that she goes back to in Taiwan. That was a fascinating read. But there's just so many things for me to recommend this book to you. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Go get it. It's been out since 2016. And if you haven't read it, you should. Let's get to that interview with Yishun so she can tell you a little bit more about the book and about her work as an editor, etc. I hope you enjoy the interview. Hi, Yishun. How are you? It's so good to have you on the podcast. I am well, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a long time coming, so I'm thrilled that we can finally make this happen. I am as well. And we are here to talk about a variety of topics, including your book. But before we get to that, I would love for my listeners to just get to know you a little bit. So if you want to share uh, a little bit about yourself and your life, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I live in Southern California. I've been a writer and editor for a very long time. Um, I love it to pieces. It's the only career in the world in which you can kind of anticipate the next moment knowing that something potentially good is about to come your way. Um, I write um, mostly nonfiction work, but my longer work is dedicated to the work of fiction. Um, as you know, I've, I've written a novel and I'm at work on a second one. Um, and I also volunteer for the Disaster Relief Agency Shelterbox, which I mention because it is primarily on my mind since I'm in the middle of a big fundraising effort for it right now. So you'll excuse that mild discretion. Um, but also, I um, am just really happy to be here and, and, you know, really enjoy writing and reading and, and in general spreading the word about great literature that's out there. So it sounds like this will be a good conversation to come. Yeah. And I loved your non or your fiction book. Um, it's called Not a Self-Help Book, which is a, a great title. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the story? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the story is uh, the story of a young woman named Marty Wu, uh, who is a, an advertising sales executive in New York City. Um, and it was published in 2016, so you'll excuse me if I have to dig back into my, <laughs> dig back into my archives of my brain a little bit. Once you move on to a second book, it's kind of like you, you, the, the first one kind of goes away and goes dormant for a little bit. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a coming-of-age a coming of age story about a woman who's in her mid-20s, and she's trying really hard to navigate this idea of uh, independence, not so much of financial independence in the way that we would consider it ordinarily, but more by way of gaining independence from an overbearing mother. Um, and she's got a lot of baggage when it comes to things like you know, cultural affects. She's a 1.5-generation person. So uh, she was born in Taiwan, but uh, then moved here when she was a very young age. She's got a lot of baggage when it comes to uh, handling the idea of being part American and part Asian. Um, so the story is really her, her trying to find her way in life and making sure that she manages to fulfill her own aspirations before she, uh, before she loses them entirely. So in terms of the book, were there autobiographical elements in the story or in Marty's character? Well, I think that one one big pitfall that uh, debut novelists always fall into is um, pinning a lot of the book to uh, to their to their lives, um, and I think you'll find this in in a lot of a lot of first novels and a lot of um, people who are who are trying out writing for the first time, and it actually is like a, a really big struggle to distance yourself. So, I by by a brief way of answering your questions, I will say yes, uh, and then I will say that I worked really hard to make sure that there wasn't too much of myself in the in the in the novel at the end of the publication period. Um, but yeah, certainly the, the Ken Kesey, I think, at some point said that you should only write what you know. Um, and of course, he's not speaking about um, you know hard facts things like oh, I have never been to Paris, uh, so therefore I can never write about Paris. You know that kind of thing. Although although I am of two minds about that as well. What he's talking about is have you trod the emotional territory that you are writing about? Um, so certainly, uh, you know, Marty shares some biographical details with me. Um, I also was born in Taiwan and then came here at a very young age. Um, and I think a lot of immigrants, though, you'll find uh, have the same experience as Marty does, where she's just trying really hard to balance these two worlds, right? Uh, a lot of the friends that I grew up with who 
who are Asian American also um, spoke English at school, but then once they crossed that threshold and went home, they immediately were launched into another language and uh, another culture, you know, where it's a very patriarchal culture, and so the, the, the parents are everything. My parents in particular are Confucian, Confucianist, um, which means they're very big on hierarchy and they're very big on tradition and very big on ceremony. Um, and uh, although Marty's family doesn't share that, those are certainly the underpinnings of, of her life. Yeah. And it's very complicated, especially in terms of the fact that her father is not present. Um, yeah, and exactly. So she right. is part of this kind of patriarchal society, but her own father isn't around. Yeah. But she does have a very complicated relationship with her mother, which is compounded by a lot of different things. Communication styles, I think, you know, they're different. They come at communication different from a, a lot of perspectives, but especially, I think, um, because of the way that they were both raised, they communicate, and they can't quite seem to communicate together. Yeah, you know what, Sarah, I'm so glad that you picked up on that, because that was one of the things that um, that, that I really struggled with when, when I was actually revising the book. I mean, the reality is that, that although the book is told in this kind of freewheeling diary format, um, I had to somehow make it a point to underscore the fact that Although Marty's mother is communicating in what ostensibly looks like English um, from Marty, Marty's diary, because Marty does not write Mandarin in her diary, because then how it would be accessible to any of you, right? Um, she she is trying really hard then to having to having to bridge the gap between translating for her mother and parsing as a native language speaker what exactly her mother is saying to her. You know, so there's this huge kind of like disconnect between them already, even though they are ostensibly speaking the same language. So I'm so glad you picked up on that. That's really um, that's really gratifying to me to hear. My editor will be super glad to hear that you that you. Picked up on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you do you do touch on it a little bit in terms of the differences in the language. And so as Marty is narrating something, she'll say, you know, there's there's not a good word for this in English, but we have this right. great word that means whatever it is and you know it encompasses this huge idea yeah 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 it's 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 kind of interesting because i find myself doing the same thing in my own conversations where uh, every once in a while if if i'm tired or if i'm really reaching for something i will have to tell my friends you know there's this there's this word that we use in in xyz language and we don't have it in in english but let me just tell you what it is as if as if they could understand it right, <laughs> right. <laughs> let me just tell you what it is and hopefully you'll be able to pick up on it <laughs> i think one of my favorite parts of the book was when marty is teaching English as a second language to high school students and yeah. the one student tells her that he loves the movie there are snakes on this airplane right <laughs> right and then and then he starts quoting Samuel L Jackson I laughed so hard and I had to read that passage to my husband who was like you're weird <laughs> I am. I'm really glad to hear to hear that you found that amusing. I um, oh my gosh. I actually I actually did go to see the movie. Uh, this this plane has snakes. Yeah, this plane has snakes. Right, that's what it is. I'm actually literally translating in my head right now. And uh, I saw it with my elderly uncle. Uh -huh. And when we were in the movie together, he was so frustrated by the quality of the middle of that, that of the movie that he yelled out in the middle of the movie theater, "What a crappy film!" <laughs> and then like tried to leave, but my aunt would not let him go and do that. And this is. This is, keep in mind, this is like my brother and I were visiting. We were in Taiwan. This is like the village where, you know, where my uncle is known and people know him. And I, she was just so funny. She's like, no, you can't leave. People know us here. <laughs> I don't leave. <laughs> it's bad enough that you yelled crappy film in the middle of the movie. Right? That's awesome. <laughs> oh, so um, what was your inspiration for this particular story and Marty as a character? You know, I got really tired of um, – how can I phrase this without, without sounding really bitter about it? Um, there is a, a problem that we have in the Asian-American demographic where we tend to be overlooked and lumped in with the Caucasian demographic. Um, and I say this, I say this with, with full knowledge that, that I am you know, aware that I probably did some of this myself. Like, I, I don't think that I understood that I was not white for a very, very long time. Um, so, you know, I grew up in Southern California where we have a very healthy population of, of Asian Americans, and we're in a position uh, economically and educationally, uh, aspirationally wise, okay, where we uh, are always trying to achieve, okay, that's the demographic. Um, but I needed to, to show people that there is a constant problem within 
our particular culture that denigrates the younger generation, that is continuously putting them down, that doesn't allow this second generation or this 1.5 generation to pursue the things that, that they would want to do. Okay. Um, so for me, it, it wasn't so much. There's there are there's a, there's an MFA program out there that has a major called like writing for social justice. Okay, and I always kind of cast my eyes sideways at that because I, I don't believe that you write because you have an axe to grind. I think you write because you are driven to write, and then um, if you can put those powers to use for the act of the social good, that's that's fantastic, right? So I don't want to give the illusion that I set out to write a wrong when I wrote this book. This was just a story that I need to tell because it was the story of so many young Asian American women that I knew that I didn't feel it could be overlooked. But nobody ever talks about it. You know, we had the one, we had the one um, breakthrough, the Joy Luck Club. Okay, back in back in the what was it like early '90s or late '80s? Okay, um, Amy Tan wrote the Joy Luck Club. People's eyes were opened. Wow. Uh, this type of this type of plight of you know of, of Asian women really does exist, but it was cast not in America. It was it was it was cast in or was, sorry it was it took place in uh, in China, right? Um, it came to America afterwards, but it was very much an immigrant story, okay? Um, a broken language and uh, clashing cultures and all that, okay? Um, I wanted in some way, shape, or form to be able to convey the idea that this is happening right now in America. No matter, no matter how far removed you think you are from your home country, it is, it is happening to Asian American women right now. So it was one of those things where it was just, it's a story that I knew, again, I knew it really, really well, and I felt like it had to be told. So it was, it was just, um, I suppose that's where it came from. And it was kind of the book that I, I felt like I needed to write before I, I wrote anything else, you know, so... That's uh, that was that's sort of the potted version of it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I am going to interrupt here so that we can take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking more about the other aspects of Yishan's life in terms of her editing and her uh, her nonfiction writing, etc. So stay tuned. You are listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Yishan Lai. We were just speaking about her fiction novel, uh, her fiction work, not a self-help book, The Misadventures of Marty Wu. And now we're going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about her website and her work with editing, her work with nonfiction writing, etc. So let's go ahead and get back to that interview. Your website is called The Good Dirt. <laughs> um, yeah. Why? Oh, okay. So I, I I have had people ask me if it's because I'm I'm really good at gossiping, and I it's I'm actually a really bad gossip. <laughs> I, mean, I I you didn't know, even, it's, I, I even you know, think I'm about terrible gossip. That's all. You, oh yeah. What, what what were you thinking it might be? Um, I I don't know. Uh, seeds maybe. Uh, okay. Something yeah, along those good. lines. They're, they're, there actually is a seed catalog uh, that that has this moniker, and there also is a religiously affiliated um, farming group that has that 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 has some ties to to the good dirt. Okay, um, it it came for me because when I was in my early twenties, I was living in New York City, and I was learning a lot about being an outdoors person. Believe it or not, it's so weird. In New York, um, okay. New York City is yeah. New York City is where I learned to rock climb. It's where I learned to kayak. It's where I learned to mountain bike. It's where I learned to orienteer. It's where I learned to snowshoe and cross country to see. So all of these things that, that comprise my outdoor life um, w were things I learned in New York City. And I think for a part of me, because I had grown up in this household where it was like, oh, you know, good girls don't do this, that, or the other thing, um, I was determined to um, in some way prove that there was such a thing as, as dirt that was good. <laughs> mm, okay. So, so 
there it was. <laughs> Kind of all there is to it. Now, I still believe that dirt is is good. I really, really do. I have an absolute horror of earthworms, though. I, it's very strange. I know. Hmm. So, so, so for me, that's where that's where the good dirt came from. And I, I think I just got lazy and I didn't want to change it. <laughs> hey, it's hard to change your website. You know, you got There's a lot that goes into that. It is. Well, and I've now made the mistake of making it my Twitter handle, which is good dirt. Everybody, just in case. Okay? Yes, um, yes, it is. So it's it's impossible for me to, to for me to renege on that at this point now. So I don't really know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well you're just going to have to answer that question a lot. Right, exactly, exactly. At any rate, on your website, uh, you talk a bit about your, your writing coaching and your editing work. So tell us a little more about that. I work, um, excuse me, that was a, a weird kind of sideways slip. Um, I work primarily with uh, writers who need an editor, uh, who have the desire for an editor. Um, typically, that work looks like either developmental editing or uh, or manuscript critiquing. Um, and what that means is, manuscript critiquing is, is me having a look at your manuscript and kind of telling you what works and what doesn't work. And developmental editing is more me going in and having a more heavy-handed approach to it, moving sections around, giving you advice on what, on what belongs where. There is a tertiary um, part of that, which is line editing, and that's more where we get down into style. Um, I don't list that because I'm more interested in the developmental aspects of editing and kind of helping a person to make sure they tell their story um, in the right in the right format and in the right style. Um, I work with both nonfiction and fiction manuscripts. I adore nonfiction, um, but I also, as you know, adore fiction and uh, and and love the ways stories are put together and the varying ways in which people can tell their own stories. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's essentially what I do in terms of editing services, and it's it is by far one of the most rewarding aspects of what I do in my overall writing life. Um, I see it as akin to the writing editing, or sorry, the the writing coaching um, offering that I have on my website as well, which is more kind of working very closely one-on-one -on, -one on a regular basis with people to determine uh, what they need in terms of the next step of their writing careers and how to get there. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Thank you. And it's clearly something that you're passionate about. It You can hear it when you're talking about it. So that is awesome. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Awesome. Um, either as an editor or an author, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you sent me this question, I was like, geez, is, is it different, like, for, for an editor versus, versus, for a, versus for somebody who produces writing? Um, and I've been noodling over that ever, ever since I got your questions, like, two weeks ago. And I, I don't know that I can tell a difference. You know, I kind of think that the, the most basic piece of writing, and I don't want to insult your listeners by, by assuming that they don't already know this, but people always need to be reminded that they have to be great readers before they can be great writers. Like, that is, that is absolutely critical. In, in my peregrinations around college classrooms, I always run into the college student who's like, well, I'm not so much of a reader, I just want to be a writer. And you're like, no, darling, that does not, that do not fly, you know? Um, partially because you need to know what great writing looks like, right? And also partially because the wellspring of information, or sorry, inspiration that you can get from, and inspiration, okay, fine, um, that you can get from reading other writers is, is eternal. It will never, ever, ever die out on you. You will always learn something great from reading somebody else. So, okay, yeah, be a, be a, you know, be a great reader. But then also, I think it's really important to know that it's super, super critical for you to have a really thick skin in this process. People, it's not that people overlook it. I think it's just that we forget what it feels like to be shot down over and over and over again. And also, not very many people have the opportunity to be shot down over and over and over and over again. <laughs> So, which is a good thing for all the rest of you who are trying to make a go at this writing thing. Um, but, you know, if you are going to try and make a go of this, you are going to be rejected over and over and over again. The big mistake that I made when I was, when I was, pitching, um, when I was pitching Not a Self-Help Book for the first time is I was convinced that the book was complete. So probably for the first two or three months of my pitching process, I did not religiously save every piece of personal feedback I got from agents or from publishing houses who were looking at the book. Um, the thing is that even though you will eventually get that book published and you will move on to another project, the things that those editors and agents are flagging as being reasons they didn't pick up on your book are probably lessons that you can apply to your, to your future works because they are marks of what they see in your voice or how you're putting the story together, right? So um, I would look at them not so much as rejections. Um, I would look at them as places for you to learn and improve. There's always somebody that you can learn from. 
if you're getting personal feedback from uh, an agent or from an editor, then that stuff should be kept under lock and key and reviewed and looked at over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, I knew better. When I was pitching this book, like, I knew way better. I had been through a master's program. I had pitched a couple of novels before. I worked in advertising sales like Marty Wu for a very, very long time. I knew what it was like to get rejected. Um, but so for me to not take that uh, for me to not take that advice was was really 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 silly. Um, the other thing is this idea of consistent learning. Um, it can be applied to things like reading, but it also can be applied to things like continuously going to writers' conferences or um, you know looking at places for you to contribute to literary community um, or being a better literary citizen, i.e., going to people's readings or um, you know contributing in some way, shape, or form to the forming of either a writers' conference or uh, some kind of literary uh, gathering. All that stuff will enhance your literary life. So. It's. I think it's a pretty big part of what we do as writers, you know, is looking laterally for opportunities for us to become better writers and not necessarily considering that just like butt in chair, you know, and banging out a copy, you know? Yeah, thank you. So in terms of reading then, who are some of your favorite authors and genres? Okay, so here's where I confess, although I should be really proud about this since I probably read all of the thrillers that I want to read. I am a big fan of the thriller genre. I am obsessed with how people get readers to continuously turn pages. I think this is something that literary fiction might suffer from, is this idea of, okay, how is it that thriller writers keep readers turning pages over and over and over again? Sometimes we get bogged down in the, the way a turn of phrase feels, right, or the way that we put a sentence together and how nice that sounds. But um, things that we can learn from screenwriters and from writers of mystery books or horror books or suspense books, like um, Lee Child or Stephen King or Dick Francis, all of these people are folks who are masters at the art of character development and getting us to turn pages. So that's that's a genre that I will always go back to time and time and time again. Ruth Rendell, P.D. James, Lee Child, whom I've, who I've just mentioned, um, and, and Dick Francis I go back to over and over and over again. Um, and of course, I'm always looking for, for new writers as well. I've just discovered Rachel Housel Hall, um, who is, is a great mystery writer. Her heroine, Eloise Norton, is an African-American um, detective in Los Angeles, and I just, I just love the way that, that Rachel manages to have us you know, turn pages over and over and over again until we get to the next plot point. Um, I've also been reading a reasonable amount of, of nonfiction lately, and I came across a book um, that just really struck at the heart of me and made me immediately want to pass it on. Um, it's by a guy named Michael Copperman, and he wrote about his experience um, teaching in the Mississippi Delta uh, for two years as part of Teach for America. Um, and his book is called, is called Teacher, Two Years in the Mississippi Delta. It's, it's very, very, very good. It's published by University Press. It's great. Um, so this is more maybe like stuff I've read recently, but that works for you, doesn't it? Yeah, that works. Um, good. And actually, I'm also... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just no, no, I appreciate on. that you brought up the Eloise Norton character because I've been reading a lot lately uh, how few women of color are represented in the mystery and thriller genre. So yeah. it's great that you bring up someone that we can look for, you know, a, another person that we can, another author that we can look to. Yeah, she's Rachel Hazel Hall is, is a master at this kind of thing. So she's, uh, I think she's on her... She's got multiple books now um, out, out in the Eloise Norton series, so so the, there's an endless an endless rabbit warren for me to fall down, which is a good thing. Um, I'm also exploring a really, really, really wonderful series of um, uh, discreetly published, uh, discreetly D I S C R E T E, discreetly published, um, uh, longer essays produced by the creative nonfiction folks, uh, and it is called True Stories. Uh, and they're they're independently published pamphlets of longer essays, and they they send you one every month. It's brilliant. Oh, nice! <laughs> yeah, it's really fantastic. And you know, it's really great because when you're standing in the grocery checkout line, or if you're at the doctor's office or whatever, you don't necessarily have to read the magazines from five years ago that they have stacked up there. <laughs> right? I mean, you can actually pull this little pamphlet out of your pocket and look really, really elegant reading this tiny little beautifully produced. And they all have these gorgeous line drawings on the front of them. Oh, they're so pretty. They're so pretty. Nice. Great. Yeah, that's really nice. So so those are the things that, that are on my reading list lately. Yeah, okay. In terms of, uh, since you mentioned nonfiction, what types yeah. of nonfiction writing do you like to do? Do I like to do? Oh, I love essays. Essays make me so happy. The, you know, the thing I haven't practiced in a long time that, that I used to write a lot of is what I call the hermit crab essay, what I call. So I, the world of nonfiction calls it the hermit crab essay. Um, do you know about this form? I don't. 
Oh, it's brilliant. It's so much fun. Okay, so first of all, you have seen hermit crabs. You've seen them, you know, either in the wild or maybe rolling around in the mall where they have those sad little kiosks where you can buy a hermit crab, yes, right? Yes, yes. Okay. okay, so hermit crabs, hermit crabs are creatures that will actually actively go up to another hermit crab if it sees that the hermit crab is living in a shell that it prefers. And then it will grab that hermit crab and rip it out of its shell and then crawl into the, the, the new vacant shell. Did you know that? Um, I think I maybe have heard that, but dang, hermit crabs. I know. Seriously. Dang, hermit crab. So anyways, these hermit crab, the reason it's called the hermit crab essay is because, it's because it is an essay that looks like something but actually is something else. Okay. So for instance, one of the favorite essays that, that I was just reminded of um, that I really like is an essay on, on it looks like a, a series of origami instructions, but it's really an essay about PTSD and something terrible that this, that this writer experienced. Um, I wrote one a little while ago that, that looks like it's a listing on, uh, on eBay. Um, it's called The Seller's Other Items, uh, but it really actually is like a commentary on how my personal style has changed over the years. So, you know, these little, and then I think I wrote something that was like, that comprised entirely dictionary entries. So these little essays that, that force the writer to, to conform to a different form, but then also encourage the writer to do something different uh, and explore a little bit deeper are, are things that I, I love to toy with. So I love to write the Hermit Crab essay. I just haven't really, you know, found, found one recently. Um, that, that I can that I can play with. And then I just bumped into a guy on Twitter whose name is um, um, Robert, who just, I can only give you his Twitter handle. It's Rob Hollywood. But he's the publisher of a wonderful literary magazine called Midwest Gothic. Uh, and he's been toying with the idea of micro... Let's see if I can get this right. Uh, I'm just coining this term right now, so you heard it here first. Okay? <laughs> uh, it, is, it is graphic micro-memoir, i.e., he does a little drawing of an item that he that he remembers from his childhood or from his recent past or whatever, and then he writes a little memoir to go in the background of it. It's beautiful. Oh, fun. Yeah. Okay. It's, Rob Hollywood. It's, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, so Rob Hollywood is the, um, is the, is the, is the Twitter handle, um, and uh, the real name has just popped in my head. It is, it is Robert Russell James, and he's, he's fantastic. He's great. And, of course, the, the literary magazine he edits for, is, uh, or he publishes, is really wonderful, too. Um, but, yeah, you know, so I've been doing a little watercolor myself, and um, I love the idea of, of producing something that is not only a, a work of visual art, but that also can fulfill the, the side of me that is, um, that is, that is ostensibly a writer <laughs> as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Jumping in here so we can take our second and final break of the podcast. But I also just wanted to tell you that you have no idea how much laughter I actually edited out of this interview because I laughed uh, uh, even more than I'm laughing and I'm laughing like a maniac throughout this interview. But I, I just had so much fun and I think that you can probably tell that I'm having fun. I hope you're having fun, and I hope you'll stick around. Stay tuned. You are listening to the GSMC Book Review Tired Podcast. Tired of searching the vast right jungle back. of podcasts? Um, now listen um, close um, and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion to my interview with author Yishan Lai. Um, speaking of literary magazines, um, you do work, you work with the Tahoma Literary Review. What, uh, what's your work there with them? 
Oh, I do. I'm so lucky. I am part owner of the Tome Literary Review, and I also edit the prose there. Um, lately, I've been editing a lot of fiction and having some of my hands in the nonfiction. Um, but, you know, it is such a pleasure to see the literary community alive and well and wanting to submit. Uh, last submission period, we got over a 1,000 submissions, which meant a lot of reading, but it also is such a privilege to know that these people are willing to entrust their work and, uh, you know, their, their memories and their memoirs to somebody that they've that they have never known before, they've never met, you know, and it's such a wealthy, wealthy, wealthy world. I think we had something like um, 600 or so fiction submissions and, um, and, and, oh my goodness, a ton of poetry submissions. So it's just, it's just really nice to know that our literary world is so rich and so thriving and that so many people out there do feel compelled to write. Um, our literary magazine is working really hard at creating what we call sustainable lit. That's hashtag sustainable it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like an advertising machine. It's You're crazy. Awesome. I think I, part of me never left, uh, never left the advertising I was just going to say, hey, have you ever worked in advertising? You should think about it. <laughs> So, so it's, uh, the, the idea behind Sustainable Lit is that we pay everybody from top to bottom. So the editors get paid, the cover artists get paid, the, the proofer gets paid, um, and most importantly, for our purposes anyways, the writer gets paid. Um, you know, there is this unfortunate kind of habit in the literary community where um, writers often do not expect to get paid. Poets uh, are, are the, the biggest kind of group that I can think of that, that expects to not get paid for their work, um, which is sad, you know, because like when you're reading the nonfiction and people hand you like a, a piece of themselves you know they hand you part of their lives and part of their memories and this this painful thing that happened to them that they're trying to excavate and make sense of and you're going to pay them nothing for it that's that's not a good feeling you know i mean you want to give them something for it and make them feel like they're like they're like they're uh like their writing is worth something that their hard-earned memories are, are worth something that this pain they've gone through in producing this piece is, is worth something um which is not to say that money should be the end all be all of everything. I do a lot of writing for free. Um, you know, I, most of the writing I do for, for the disaster relief agency obviously is free. Um, you know, there, there are plenty of places that I'll, that I'll write for free at. I've taught for free. Um, I just don't want that to become a habit. You right. Know? And we don't um, expect people like our plumbers to, you know, we don't say, well, yeah. come in and fix my drain. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to pay you. I just would let, you know, you, could, you you've got this experience you should just use it for my betterment. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's so exactly it. why I don't understand why we, we think in terms of the arts sometimes that people should not be um, compensated for their time. Right. Exactly. And, and for their, for their effort, you know, and again, for the, for the, for the hard emotional work of trolling through something that may have been, that may have been difficult for them. And, you know, I, yeah, fiction is, is definitely, um, clearly it's fiction. Okay. And so it may not have been something that, that you've experienced yourself, but it does take a lot of energy and heart to be able to put some of these things down on paper, you know? Um, so yeah, so we're working, we're working hard towards a sustainable model of, of, uh, of literature, um, which we would like to, we would like to pass on. One of the things we do is we create a, transparency index for every issue that allows you to see where we spent the, the submissions fee and why. Um, we, do, we do charge a submission fee. We offer a feedback option where you can pay an extra $2 and you get some real actionable feedback on it. Um, the reality is that I, I tend to provide some feedback if I find, if I find a piece has, you know, has, has something that the, that the writer can work on anyways. Um, but uh, but it is it is a good way for writers to um, both guarantee some actionable feedback, but also at the end of the day to know that they're supporting you know an effort that is putting everything it can towards promoting a good sense of literary community. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of our edict. I mean, we you know, we obviously do the do the thing that most literary magazines do, I think, which is promoting writers that have contributed to the publication in the past, uh, no matter how long ago it was. I mean, we've just had somebody from issue one who just had a novel come out, and we're yeah we're we're crazy about that. You know, we keep on promoting it because it matters to us that these writers succeed. And we see our involvement in that process as being a key part of that process. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So you are obviously very passionate about writing, about editing, about this work in general. Is it, did you know from an early age that this was what you wanted to do? Or did that come to you later in life? So in Taiwan, we do this thing where at a certain age, you put the kid on the table and you line up a bunch of objects in front of the kid. And then whatever one the kid crawled towards first is supposed to be that person's career. Huh. Um, so yeah, I went towards a piece of food. <laughs> Who can Which blame is, you? Who can blame by you? By the way, not it was actually not part of the objects that were offered. It was just there. <laughs> <laughs> just, just deep 
mostly unfortunate choices. You know, like <laughs> life choices gone entirely wrong already from, from the very beginning. Can, um, I, can I ask you a follow up question, though? I mean, how often yeah. is this something that, that, that people have noticed tends to pan out? I mean, is there some... God, I never asked. Why didn't I ever think to ask this question? Like, this is why we do these podcasts, because somebody will ask the question that I never bothered to ask myself. I don't know. I need to go home and ask my mom. I'll, I'll, I'll ask her, and I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, we'll, we'll do a follow-up podcast, and yeah. I'll let you know. <laughs> I think people can hope, you know. Um, and and then, then when they set me right again, I, I apparently did go for the writing implement. So, so that's... I, I, I can't say that I knew per se, but we can say that it was foretold in a mystical fashion, maybe. Um, I, when, I was, when I was seven or so, I was looking at the masthead of Vogue magazine, and I told my mom I wanted to be on the masthead one day. Um, that did not happen. Uh, but then, yeah, I mean, I was writing kind of like weird, loose, short stories. But I think every kid does that, you know, in their eights and nines, right? They kind of make things up and put them down. Whether it's, whether they have a narrative, right? Whether it's by way of making a funky drawing or something, there's, there's some kind of sense of narrative, you know? So, so let's, let's, let's not assume that any of that stuff was, was foretold. Um, I suppose when I, when I knew, Gosh, I, I think I kind of, I think I kind of always knew, like at least from at least from high school, that I wanted to, I wanted to write for a living. Um, a friend of mine and I. Oh, actually, no, I have, I, I have proof that I can that I can corroborate with somebody else. Um, my friend Kara and I were saving up for uh, for Lewis and Clark Colleges, um, like Summer Institute for Writers. I want to say. Um, so that was in high school, uh, and then at some point in time, I thought I was going to become an attorney, uh, and that was like crazy delusional. I don't know whatever thought made me think that I could like pass the LSAT. I actually took the LSAT um, and uh, rapidly found myself filling out all C's because I was so just unhappy um, with the with the exam. <laughs> so that was that was parental money wasted and gone down the drain. Um, but you know, through college, I wrote and edited, um, and and through part of high school as well, I wrote and edited for the for the high school paper um, and then yeah you know after that after that I just I just knew that I wanted to get into publishing at least you know in some way shape or form tried my hand at magazines uh, turns out I'm not really good at facts <laughs> so like not so much with that you okay. know? so so yeah so you know narrative is kind of is kind of where it where it ended up being that's uh that's that's uh, I, I think I'm lucky you know I think I'm lucky that way it's it was just one of those things where like I had the the privilege and the wherewithal to pursue to, to pursue this kind of thing um and I kind of think that you know we talked before about about advice for writers so I do write advertising copy um I have we talked about the J Peterman catalog did we do that already no we didn't okay so you know you know how Elaine on Seinfeld used to work for J Peterman mm-hmm. so I was Elaine before Elaine was Elaine oh. um yeah, do, in do 1990s. Like that? What's that? Do you dance like that? <laughs> that is something I will never, ever, ever show you. Okay. <laughs> Dang. You will just have to guess. <laughs> so, uh, some might say yes. Some might say yes. In my better moments, some might say no. <laughs> um, it, so, so in 1996, 97, uh, I applied to be a writer for the J. Peterman catalog, and they say yes. And then shortly after that, Elaine got the job at J. Peterman. So, <laughs> wow. so yeah, so it was kind of crazy. And, and check this out. I lived in Astoria, Queens, which is, okay, where Marty lives as well. All right. So I lived in Astoria, Queens. And do you know what? I lived down the street from where they filmed George Costanza's <laughs> parents' house. That's awesome. Cannot escape it. No. Seinfeld is like the bane of my existence. Apparently. Wow. <laughs> I know. So, yeah. So, advertising copy is one of those things that I feel like people denigrate. You know, when they say, when you hear, oh, you write marketing copy or you write advertising copy, uh, people often say oh, to themselves, you know, if they're writing this copy, well, I'm not doing any real writing. Well, you are. You know, you're putting words on paper and somebody's paying you for it. Like, that's, it's fine. And also, it's very, it has to be very persuasive writing. You know, you have to sort of like dial down really, really quickly. And in fact, I actually find myself stuck in this um, in, in my, my own writing now because I also write for the Writer Magazine. And my copy is usually pretty tight for them. So whenever I write an article about uh, humor or about selling your book or whatever, anything like that, I tend to uh, hew pretty closely to the desired word count. Um, but then I worry that I'm not writing long enough. And I think that's because of long practice of sticking to you know, the message and making sure that there isn't any extraneous stuff and that it's all just laid out for you. you know? So... So yeah, I mean it's it's great practice and it is writing. It is writing. So if you're putting your words down on paper and you're getting paid for it, even if it's press releases, that's okay. It's writing experience. 
You know, it's writing experience. So, you know, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Like, if you're writing tweets for a living, it's still writing experience. So that's, that's, that's the final piece of advice that I'll, that I'll leave with you when it comes to, like, you know, telling people about this writing business that we, that we think is assuming our lives or consuming our lives. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, can I ask what you're working on now, the, the second novel? Is, is that open for discussion? Yes, it is always open for discussion. I think the more I talk about it, the more it will force me to actually do something about it. That's a theory. <laughs> um, the, next, the next work is completely, um, completely different from, from Marty Wu in that um, it, it, well, gosh, see, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm, I'm seeing parallels. Um, so the book is a time travel piece. Uh, it involves the, uh, the great um, exploration age of the, 19, the 19, uh, early 1910s and, and, uh, and 1920s. Um, and it, uh, it involves a young woman who, who goes back in time to encounter one of these Antarctic explorers. Um, I have always wanted to put a woman in Antarctica, oh my goodness, that's really hard to say, in Antarctica uh, during the exploration age. In the 1910s and 1920s, women were doing amazing exploration things. There were two women who got in a car and drove across the Mojave Desert. They drove across Death Valley because that's what they wanted to do. There were women, there were scores of women who went to teach in Colorado, you know, because that's what, that's what women were supposed to do, but they had incredibly hard lives then, right? Uh, there were the missionary women who had to encounter a lot of different hardships in order to be able to do this thing that they, they, were, they were called to do or that they were bound by duty to do. But, you know, women were doing great exploration things, and yet they were never invited. There were three women who asked Ernest Shackleton if they could join onto his Antarctic expedition, you know? So we've always had this desire to do things. We just, we just don't really, we just don't really hear about them. I have a friend whose theory is that, is that well, women just don't feel the need to bark about it, okay? And I'm, I'm not going to make a judgment on that in one way, shape, or form. But I do wish that we had more attention called to these things. The other part of what I'm exploring in this novel and with this novel has to do with some work I've been doing around Manzanar, which is the... Have you been to Manzanar? <laughs> it's the Japanese internment camp, right? That's in Independence, California. Right, yes. Um, and, you know, I've written a couple of essays about it, and I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by it, because as we're doing a lot of thinking about this, this, um, this, this concept of privilege um, and hardship, you know, and, and what it means to, be, um, to, to experience genuine hardship and what that, what that kind of makes of us, um, I keep on wondering, like... What would it mean for somebody uh, of, of our vintage to have to be subjected to something like Manzanar, like a Japanese internment camp, you know? Mm-hmm. So I do wonder, I do wonder what it would be like for, for um, somebody of, of, our, of our time period to actually have to experience hardship of the type that is historical, you know, stuff that, that we don't actually know because we've already, quote, unquote, explored all there is to explore, right? Um, you know, we don't live in the sticks. Uh, everything is pretty much within, at a minimum, an hour's drive from us, right? You can order crap from Amazon if you like, and it'll arrive the next day no matter where you are, you know? So not technically it's, true. It's, My parents can't get Prime. <laughs> <laughs> they can order it prime, but it takes three to four days. <laughs> oh, goodness. I know. It's All right, just... so they have, to, they have to do a little bit of planning, right? <laughs> it's just the hardship. That's genuine hardship, Sarah. That is really hard. Life is hard. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I'm always curious to see what would happen if we push ourselves just a little bit more, right? So I'm curious to see what will happen to this, to this young lady. Um, and I can already see in the manuscript, I'm about 60,000 words in now. I can already see in the manuscript um, how she's... Uh, how she's staring with that. Um, and I have to say that, that four months ago, I was 57,000 words in, so I have made progress. Nice. Yes, I have. Yes, and I have. 3,000 celeb- words of progress. We'll celebrate that progress. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I totally should. I should do something about that. You should buy some shoes. I should buy some shoes. Oh, you're a genius. <laughs> Thanks. You're a genius, Sarah. Thanks. <laughs> so um, where can people find you on social media, the, uh, your websites, whatever you want to share. Please find me on Twitter. I adore it. It's a wonderful medium. It probably plays to my pithy side. Although now that they've boosted it to 280 characters, I kind of don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> um, and uh, you should sign up for my newsletter, which you can find at my website, thegooddirt.org. Um, and you should friend Tahoma Literary Review on Facebook and follow our Twitter feed as well, which is Tahoma Review. And you should come see us at AWP, which I know is not strictly online. 
I am listening to you, Sarah. I really am, I promise. <laughs> but AWP is this awesome conference that's coming up in Tampa, Florida. Uh, it is all about writers and writing programs and small and medium presses. So if you are going to AWP, please come see us. We're at booth number 547. Nice. We're looking forward to seeing you. And what does a- AWP stand for? stands for the Association of Writers and Writing Programs. So okay. theoretically, it should be AW squared P. Right. But that's but harder we're not to math say. People. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. No one said there'd be math. You shouldn't. <laughs> Nobody said there'd be math. (laughs) (laughs) It has been lovely talking to you. You are amazing. But is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to get out there? No, but I want everybody to have a really nice day. You all look really beautiful, and I love the color that you're wearing today. (laughs) Thanks. I I, I wore it just for you. Okay. On that note, um, I do really appreciate you taking the time and uh, being patient because we have gone through what feels like 17 years of scheduling conflicts. Um, So thank you for that. And thank you so much for joining me here on the podcast. It's been wonderful. No, thank you so much. I'm so glad for the service you provide, and I can't wait to hear this go up. And everybody should be a fan of of this this podcast because everybody needs to know about great books and about great writers that are out there. That's true. Thank you. That's a wonderful note to wrap up on. Thank you. Thank you. I once again want to thank my guest for today's podcast, author Yishan Lai. I, I've said it about 16 million times. Yes, I love hyperbole. I've said it about 16 million times this episode. I had so much fun speaking with her and hopefully she'll come back on the podcast one of these days because I could use the laughter endorphins. It was awesome. <laughs> Thank you to you, my listeners, as always. Yishun's right. You really do look great in that color. I'm so happy that you join me every week for these interviews. I hope you will join me again next week on Tuesday when I will be speaking with author Louise Cole about her book, The Devil's Poetry. So join me again for that interview. In the meantime, you can find all of our podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can download those podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Pretty much wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find GSMC Podcast Network and you can download those podcasts. You can also follow us on social media. Uh, Book Review is on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. We also have a blog, www.gsmcbookreviewpodcast.blogspot.com. Thank you again for joining me. As I said, please join me again on Tuesday for my interview with author Louise Cole. In the meantime... Go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Move to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program